Welcome to Movie Class by Pizza Flicks, where you can pick up some interesting tidbits on today's program. She won an Emmy for her role in a quintessential TV series as the devoted secretary to a famed criminal attorney. The actor portraying the title character grew so fond of her, he cultivated an orchid in her name. He is, of course, Raymond Burr, the series Harry Mason, and the Emmy went to Barbara Hale. Before she found fame on TV, Hale was already an established leading lady on the big screen, but acting wasn't her original career goal. Upon graduating high school, Hale attended the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts with the hope of becoming a commercial illustrator. However, her dazzling looks sidetracked school for work as a model. Hollywood came calling after her modeling agency sent her photos to RKO Pictures, which promptly signed Hale as a contract player. Hale's first credited role was in 1943's Higher and Higher, opposite Frank Sinatra. The following year, she appeared in a pair of films in the Falcon series with the suave Tom Conway. In 1945, there was West of the Pecos, starring Robert Mitchum. But more importantly, cast in a small role was the handsome new RKO contract player, Bill Williams. The two actors fell in love and were married a year later. In a rare Hollywood feat, it was a true union of Till Death Do Us Part. At RKO, the couple starred in a pair of films, A Likely Story and The Clay Pigeon. Hale then moved over to Columbia Pictures for a variety of films, including Jolson Sings Again with Larry Parks, starred in the title role of Lorna Doon with Richard Green, and Last of the Comanches with Broderick Crawford. By the time A Lion in the Streets with James Cagney rolled out in 1953, Barbara had given birth to a third child. Thereafter, she mostly took roles in the less time-consuming new medium of television, which brings us to today's featured presentation, Lifeline from the anthology TV series, Crossroads, season one, episode 32, originally broadcast May 11th, 1956, starring Barbara Hale, Regis Toomey, and Kent Taylor. A girl working at a dance hall meets a man who gives her everything she desires, but at a price. Things go terribly wrong when he also entices her younger sister. Radio. Here in America, it's a theme that carries everything from soap ads to poetry. For Reverend Arnold Grum, it was something else. It was a lifeline that could carry his words of hope and faith into the ears and hearts of the lost. Good evening. Tonight, I want to start with a story. It's a true story. It actually happened. But it's as melodramatic as any fiction. We live in a world of law and order. But a few blocks, a few steps away, there may be people who live in a terrible jungle of crime and violence. Not long ago, a girl listened to one of my programs. It was nearly the last program she ever did listen to. And so let's talk about trouble. Everyone on Earth has some. The difference is in degree and in the manner in which we face it. One thing is certain. There is an answer for you, a good answer. But to find it requires a deep personal courage and faith in God. Isn't it worth a try? The time to help yourself is now, and there is always someone who can understand and help you. Don't be afraid to ask for the help you need. It's there, waiting for you. Reverend Arnold Grum will return to answer your letters in just one minute. Good night, Walt. Are you Reverend Brown? Yes. 
I'm Jane Sherman, and I need some of that help in a hurry. Well, I was just about to walk over to my church. Perhaps you'd like to come along. It isn't far. Uh, walking out of this building may be too far for me. I'm the closest thing to dead you've ever heard talk. Oh, well, maybe I'd better hear your whole story, Miss Sherman. We can use the studio. Thank you. The story isn't a new one, Reverend Drum. Small town girl goes to become an actress and a model. Girl goes broke. Girl ends up selling dances for 10 cents. Well, your story doesn't stop there. It certainly doesn't. I've been working at Danceland about six months, trying to save money for a ticket home. But by now, the shine was wearing off of living. Even the fact that the girls were friendly didn't help much. I was getting tired of, oh, of having all the other girls always coming to me for advice or to cry on my shoulder. Then I met Ted Diamond. talked money, but my feet hurt, so I listened to him. The next part was a dream, full of new clothes, furs, and a new address on Park Place. Ted was buying, and there wasn't a single string to it. Not until the night he took me to his private gambling club. Care for a drink? No, I don't believe so, thank you. Want to try your luck? Oh, this is Mr. Stone, Mr. Bannister, Jane Sherman. How do you do? How do you do? Play us a little light. It'll pick up. Alice is on the mark for 18 G's. Settle for half and cut him off. He's going to make trouble. That's your department. They all look like such society people. What's more, they're all rich. They won't be very long if they keep this gambling, huh? bother you? A little. Shoes are killing me. Well, let's go someplace where you can kick them off. All right. You know, that's too much money for anything honest. Sure, gambling's illegal. People are going to keep on doing it no matter how many laws they know. And what's the difference whether you gamble in a casino in Nevada or some private club set up in an apartment or a hotel? Well, I'd say about 10 years. <laughs> now with my protection, I pay out a lot of money for it every week. What would you pay me for? For your beauty, because you know how to handle other girls. They like you and trust you. How do you know that? Research. See, I didn't pick you out of that dance hall by accident. So I see. Pays big, Jane. How? Well, first you learn to act as hostess. And then you learn to shill the rich boys into visiting the club. Then you learn to shill in their business deals. Then what? Then we talk about your real job. Our real job. Would you like that, Jane? You know I would. What was worse, I fell for Ted. Found the work was easy. Not realizing what I was doing, I, I traded a smile and a promise to men for losing small fortunes over Ted's tables. I see. I hope so, Reverend Grum. I know it sounds like a bad case of true confessions, but it's the truth, every bit of it. You knew what you were doing was illegal. Yes. I wasn't thinking. Like I said, it was easy and the pay was wonderful. For a while, so was Ted. I was happy. Even after I found out the tables were crooked. Later, I found out that Ted was connected with the syndicate. And my little pink cloud was getting full of question marks. Twenty-one grand. Pretty good night. Not for Allison. Allison? Yes, he's the man that lost a fortune here, remember? 
He did pay his markers, though, didn't he, Ted? Oh, sure. He paid up. No trouble at all. That's good. It'd be pretty hard to get money from a man with a bullet in his head. Very hard. What's the point, Miss Sherman? Oh, it just mentions that he got involved in some trouble with the syndicate. That's you, isn't it, Ted? It's newspaper gossip. They tried to tap the syndicate for everything. It also mentioned you, Mr. Bannister. Why do they call you the enforcer? You read too much, Miss Sherman. Maybe you better go sharpen a pencil. You don't like me, do you, Mr. Bannister? I don't like people who are soft. Be careful she doesn't soften you up, Ted. Sixty-one cities we operate in. All mine. It's a big setup. Nothing to what it'll be when we tie it up with girls. Girls? You're going to organize a whole network of girls. Girls to work as hostesses and shields. Why, there's a dozen angles to cover. Well, Ted, I, I don't think I could... But you'd be perfect. You know where to find them, you know how to talk to them. And you're smart enough to know how to use them. Like you're using me. But don't be stupid. I'm making you the boss. You get a cut off of every girl. I'm handing you a fortune. Well, you can hand it to someone else. I don't like the smell of this. That's unfortunate. It's your baby, Jane. We made a deal. If I remember correctly, we never got around to discussing this part of the deal. Now I see why. Oh, make me see. Make me see why I picked you out of that dance hall. Do you think I spent all this dough and all my time teaching you the racket just for fun? Sorry, Ted. I thought maybe you felt the same way I did. Well, what is that supposed to mean? The answer is no. That was a mistake. Was it a mistake to fall in love with you? Well, that's your problem. Mine's business. You're a big investment to me. A bad one. You know, you're getting way out of hand. First questions and now this. You need a check rein, baby. You need a new girl? I need a hundred girls and you're going to get them for me. You're going to find them, teach them, and put them to work. Understand? And for six months, I did exactly what Ted wanted me to do. When I came back, there were girls working in every one of Ted's clubs. Girls getting their first taste of the rackets. That was your great mistake. The kind of mistake for which we often have to pay so dearly. That you mustn't lose courage. Courage I finally found. Jane, I'm glad you're back. I know you could do it. Wait till you see your new bank account. You see it. I'd rather see a good bath. Of course, I did pretty well, too, while you were away. You should see the cute doll I've got to work at this place. I can wait forever. Here she is now. You better have a look at her. The girl in the red dress. Barbara. Oh, you know her? I know her. She's my kid's sister. Now, isn't that nice? You knew this, Ted. You knew that I sent her money to go to modeling school, and you deliberately did this. It wasn't hard, and besides, I thought you'd be happy to see her doing so well for herself. Doing so well for herself. It's a kid barely out of high school walking right into a racket. Well, she's walking right out again. Relax. You're through making trouble. Through? I haven't even started. Not if you love that kid sister as much as I think you do. What do you mean? I told you you were getting out of hand. You needed a check rein. Look, Ted, she's, she's just a baby. Let her go. 
I'll do anything you want, dear. Don't hurt him. Hurt her? Don't be ridiculous, Jane. She's very precious to me. We're in love. Barbara? Why not? She's a beautiful girl. And even you found me attractive. Remember? I'll talk, Ted. If Barbara isn't on the train home by tonight, I'll be at the police talking my head off. No, no, I, uh, I didn't mean that. Of course you did, sweetheart. Uh, Ted, I, I, I'm, I'm a little upset. I know. I'm upset, too. I hate being afraid of someone. Now, you wait right here. I've got to see Bannister. Bannister? So I started running. Bannister was always behind me. In a bar, in a cafe. Whenever I turned around, he was there, staring at me. Not mad, not with hate, just that blank, empty stare. Why didn't you get to the police? I couldn't. I didn't dare go see Barbara. I did call her. What did she say? She laughed at me. She thought I was making it up because I was jealous of Ted. So there's nothing I can do except wait for Bannister. I know it sounds crazy and melodramatic, but it's true. I swear to God, it's true. Then we have work to do. Work? We're going to see that certain party. But we can. We can and we will. It's settled. Bannister, he's there. No, don't. Where was he? Right there. I, I saw him. He was standing right there staring at me. I saw him. I swear it. I believe you. Grum. Reverend Grum. Oh, yeah, he has some two-bit radio program. Funny. I never figured on Jane going to a preacher for help. You better drop in on her. I'm sure you have a lot to talk about. Hiya, zombie. Hello, Barbara. You didn't knock. Knocking's for strangers. You don't have any secrets from me, do you, Ted? No, of course not. <clears throat> but I do have a story to tell you. Or something. I'm scared. I'm scared, too. And I've been praying ever since we left the radio station. Hi, sis. Come in. I've been expecting you. Hello, Barbara. Excuse the mess. The maid hasn't been up yet. You must be the Reverend Grum. That's right. I'd almost forgotten how clever Ted can be. That's your trouble, Jane. You never appreciated Ted. But you do, hmm? I know how smart he is. Look how he figured you coming here. He must be psychic as well, or did he tell you how he happened to know it? Ted has ways of knowing most everything. Would you like to know one of those ways? Would you care to hear how a killer trailed your sister to my studio? Killer? You should have made up a better story, sis. There was a killer that followed me. It was Bannister. Bannister? Oh, that's the funniest thing I ever heard. Bannister, that meek little bookkeeper, a killer. Why do you think they call him the enforcer? Don't you ever read the papers? I don't care about newspaper gossip. Do you care about your sister's life, Barbara? You keep out of this, Mr. Preacher. You've been taken in by a lot of lies. They're not lies. They were. You think I don't know the truth? You've been taken, mister, taken good. She was Ted's girl. And now she's trying to get him back. Back? You thought because you were my sister that you could tell me a lot of stuff about Ted. 
And then, then, then I'd run home and hide under the bed. Well, it isn't true. Sit down, It didn't Barbara. work. What? I said sit down. Now, you're going to listen to me. I won't. Why? Are you afraid? Afraid? Of you? No, the truth. Your sister's risking her life trying to save you. She wants Ted, but she can't have him. He's mine. I love him. Do you still have any feeling of love for your sister? Sure. Sure. If she'd forget I'm her kid sister who needs guiding, which I don't. Has she ever lied to you before? Well, she's jealous of... Have I ever lied to you? No. Do you think I would lie to you? I don't know you so well, do I? Well, I... I guess not. Not if you're a real preacher, but you're just a... You think I'm a sucker? In spades. All right, how's your courage, Barbara? Do you have enough faith in Ted Diamond to gamble on it? Now what are you getting at? Just that. Do you have enough faith to risk being wrong? I'm not wrong. Prove it. How? You just show me, mister, and I'll prove it. You can't bluff me. All right. We're going to Ted Diamond's office. I want you to wait out in the hall. I'll leave the door open a little bit so you can hear the conversation. And if what you hear doesn't convince you that we're telling the truth, we won't bother you anymore. We'll leave you alone. Fair enough. You stay here, Jane. You'd only complicate matters. Let's get it over. Yes, of course. I'll take care of it. Thanks very much. Come on. Terribly sorry. Important business. Now, let's see, where were we? Oh, yes, uh, Jane Sherman. Well, that's a very sad story. Very sad. I'm sorry, Mr. Grumman. I, uh, I can't do anything for you. I can imagine. I'm sorry I wasted my time, Mr. Dunn. No. I won't let it slide by this easy. Why don't you get out? I'm busy. Not too busy, mister. You're just a small-time hoodlum all blown up. That when Jane Sherman testifies, you'll be right back to rat size. Now stop acting and get out. I must be pretty good. You're scared. Scared? Of Jane Sherman's testimony? We've taken care of her long ago. She's safe and sound, waiting at her sister. At her sister's apartment? Thank you. Then she's waited long enough. The banister. If you hear Jane Sherman testify, you're a medium as well as a preacher. In about 10 minutes, you'll be through talking in this life. Hello, uh, banister? Barbara's apartment. No! You wouldn't dare! Wouldn't I? Barbara! Why, you rotten, lying, smiling butcher. No, no, not now, Barbara. We've got to get to Jane before Bannister. Jane? Barbara, wait a minute. back door, so I hid behind the curtain. You hit him with a bottle? Will he live? I'm afraid so. Well, we won't if we don't get out of here. Ted's on his way. I see Bannister failed. I'll take care of her later. First, I'm going to finish Bannister's work. No. No! No! Ted! No! Ted! No! No! Ted, stop right there. Come on. Come on, give me that gun. Do you know you're not going to use it? 
Come on, Barbara. Give it to me. Give it to me. Don't think that was a mistake. I can do better. Barbara, for heaven's sakes, don't. Why? He was going to kill you. Then I'd have been next, wouldn't I, Ted? No, Barbara. Wait. You can't. I won't let you. Let me. You forget that I'm your kid sister. I'm all grown up now. Ted helped me grow up, didn't he? You helped me grow up the hard way, didn't you, Ted? Well, I'm going to pay you back. No, Barbara. No. I love you. Love? Ted, do you really love me now? Barbara. I do, I do, I swear it. Look, killing him isn't going to solve anything. Let me have the gun. Stay out of this, Jane. You have all the answers, Ted. Come on, tell Barbara. For the love of heaven, Barbara, don't. Stay back. I don't want to hurt you. Why not? Murder's murder. Is this the thanks your sister gets for trying to save your life? And now you want to kill, Reverend. You can stop her. He really isn't worth it, is he, Barbara? No. I can't even hate him. He just makes me sick. I couldn't do it anyway. I, I never did shoot one of these things before. Barbie, Barbie. Oh, Jane, I didn't mean all those terrible things I said. It's all right, baby. It's all right. One of you girls better call the police. Tell them to come quickly. I'm afraid of these things, too. And that's the story. Stranger than fiction. The truth that running away from trouble never helps. We must face it. And we must be willing to ask for help. And above all, to have faith. Faith to give us the strength we need to win. Thank you.